Tech Sergeant Roy Robert Schneider Jr. United States Army Air Corps and United States Air Force. I interviewed Roy Schneider in Las Vegas, Nevada, September 29, 2007. He lived to 2012. He was the kindest, gentlest man I think I've ever met, as you'll see through this interview. His demeanor was very soft, soft-spoken, but powerful story, folks. And I'm just really proud to share his story today on my YouTube channel and on my Voices of History radio station. Roy was drafted in 1943 as a young man. The war had been going for several years. And he flew as a gunner and a radio operator on a B-24, 35 mission, combat missions over Germany. He um, was just an amazing man. And his perspective of World War II is fabulous. He received a silver star for his actions. He also served in Korea and Vietnam, which he didn't speak much about. But his main focus was World War II and what he did as a gunner and as a waste gunner on B-24. So if you know your history, amazing bomber that we use in World War II. And uh, like I said, Roy told me his story in Las Vegas, Nevada. I interviewed about two dozen, actually four dozen uh, World War II veterans at that time for a film I produced in Las Vegas and premiered in Cook County, Nevada in 2009. Roy's gone now, but his story lives on. I want to thank Steve and Abby Rizzo. You guys, thank you for sponsoring Roy's story. You have such a heart for my veterans. Steve, love you, brother. Um, hope to meet you in person soon. And you've sponsored several of my stories. And Roy, I know, is looking down from heaven, happy that we're able to share his, his words. He was a very humble man. But Steve, I just wanted to thank you, and God bless you and Abby for stepping forward. Amen. Like I said, Roy was a very humble man. He considered the real heroes the other guys. But you know, to me, Roy was a hero. Was just a giving man. When I'd go to Las Vegas, he, he'd always give me get me a room at a hotel and just miss him dearly. One of, one of the special World War II veterans. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story like Stephen Abbey, please, there's information in the video description below the video. On my website, LarryCapetto.com, click on Sponsor a Vet. You'll see pictures of my veterans and they will help tell the stories of all the stories and you just include their name in the sponsorship and that's all you have to do. If you'd like to donate to my work, there's information in the comment section of this video. So I feel like I've forgotten something, but I just want to honor Roy Snyder. Join with me in honoring him, his memory, what he did in World War II. And the, you know, I love one of his quotes. I'm going to share one of his quotes from this video. He said, baseball players aren't heroes or football players aren't heroes. There ain't a soul in Hollywood that's a hero. The real heroes are buried over there. And he's seen some of those cemeteries, and I have too. That tells a story, folks. Who are the real heroes today? Well, I've found mine in the many veterans that I've interviewed. Thank you for watching, sharing these stories, subscribing to this channel, and God bless you. And 1943. Okay, Army? Army Air Corps. Okay. And what was your job in the military? During the war, I was a radio operator and gunner on a B-24 and flew left waist gun because the radio operator had to be able to go to his radio and engineer flew the right waist gun because they had to be available also. And the others were in turrets, four turrets. So what's the crew on a B-24, nine of you? Ten people, Ten. Uh, four officers, six enlisted. Uh, we had an excellent pilot and our, we lost him. We lost two gunners. Can you tell me the mission you were on, what you were doing? We were on uh, a raid to Bologna, Italy, and it wasn't uh, enemy. Our plane went down, uh, the plane ahead of us, 
lost a life raft, you know, the inflatable life rafts, and it came back and hit our horizontal stabilizer and hung on, just folded over it, and the plane went out of control. We were over the, we had passed enemy lines, passed the German lines, and circled back out over the ocean and dropped the bombs, and the pilot couldn't control the plane, and we got back over land, and he ordered a bailout. There was no hope for him. None. As soon as he released the controls, it flipped, went down. Six got out, three didn't. There's your, those are your heroes, especially the pilot. They're still over in Italy. Where did you have your basic training at? Took basic training at uh, Shepherd Field, Texas, uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. And uh, then I, they lost, <laughs> I was supposed to ship out after my basic training. And they uh, had a medical hold on me. And I sat there, every soul had left, there probably 600 out there boarded the, the train to leave. And the guy sat on my duffel bag. And uh, no one called my name or did anything. I went and asked what was going on. They said they didn't know. So I went back and checked and they had a medical hold on me. So I just walked over to the hospital and told them, they checked me, no, nothing wrong. Of course, then I stayed six more weeks and uh, didn't have to do anything. They put me on night duty and watering the lawn. And, you know, about four hours and that was it. But they lost my records too. My records went with a train. And they didn't have any records for about six weeks over there. So, and I didn't get any pay. I first went in, my pay was $57, $57 a month, I think. The next month it jumped to 74 that, you know. But of course, you know, the way I was born in 25, times were pretty tough. My dad died when I was seven months old. And we did, and you just had nothing really. You got by any way you could. Even at 54 bucks a month, of course I didn't get that much, but that was still quite a bit of money to me. Uh, you know, with food and clothing and housing all provided, uh, that, that wasn't bad at all. Tell me now, how many missions did you fly over there? Flew 35 missions. And you said you're radio operator? Radio operator. And I never went to Ploesti. You did? That was, a, I was scheduled to go one time and the mission was scrubbed. That was aborted. That was one, one place I did not want to go. I went to Munich three times. Okay. Now Munich, they told us had 360 guns that could bear on you at any one time. All around, that was 360 regardless of where you were around the town. We went to the marshaling yards primarily. Uh, now, when you we talked, or the information that I have about you, um, the message you left on my phone, uh -huh. you talked about the Battle of the Bulge. Oh, I, I see that I, I did nothing compared to those but, but GIs. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Give me a historical perspective of the Battle of the Bulge, what it was, the objective of the Germans, and then and then your involvement with that. Well, mine, I, I was not, I, I just referred to the Battle of the Bulge as the people that really accomplished, that really. Did you fly some missions at that time? No, no, not, okay. see, they, they flew those missions out of England. We were out of Italy, not, that was too far north for us. Okay. But I'm just saying they sacrificed a lot more than we did. The, many of the ground troops uh, did much more than than I did. I had a bed to sleep in every night and food. They they. I never had to sleep out in the snow and mud. Well, let me look at my note that I wrote down. Yeah, that was somebody Hot else. Missions bulge. Uh, no, that was someone else. No, no, you said something about uh, that. Maybe you just referenced. Yeah, I did. That's. I, uh, um, now, so you did you you weren't flying around Bastogne or that area during? That oh time? no, that was up in the northern area. That was the missions would have been flown out of England, uh, Eighth Air Force or with the Seventeens, or the B twenty fives out of England. But we flew. The farthest mission I had was to Poland. Went to Munich three times, and I don't. I kept a diary, but. It's disappeared. I have no idea what happened to it. Well, you mentioned the troops at the Battle of Balls. I mean, historically, do you have information or just... You no, I'm people? just referring to the sacrifice that those yeah. people made in relation to mine. I, that, you see, this... Mine wasn't a tenth of what theirs was. We were shot at every mission. 
and they hit us several times. But those people were, are really your heroes of the of the World War II. That and and the islands over in the Pacific. Now those they went through things that you know mine was a breeze compared to what they went through. Uh, we got we got shot up quite a bit. I mean, I saw holes come in the plane. One time, I was standing looking out over the left wing. We had a single 50 caliber gun, and a hole about that big appeared in the wing. Didn't hit a control electrical, mechanical, or, or fuel lines or anything. But you've seen pictures of. Uh, can openings or something where they come out like a star. That's the way that wing folded back and it didn't hit a, a vital object at all in the, in the wing. But I saw it, it and I couldn't see the missile or the, that went through it, but I saw the hole open up <laughs> and uh, we were flying once and I had flak. You called into the pilot and told him where it was. It was nine o'clock level on our side. I, you t had throat mics, a little, that you fastened around your neck and had a mic on either side and picked up your voice. And you generally you had a short cord about so long with a throat mic, about three to four feet long, and you had a uh, snap that you put on your vest or something, hooked it on with the switch there that you activated your mic. And lucky for me, some maintenance man had fixed mine and put about an eight foot cord on it. And I had no way really to, it was in the way if I hung it on my jacket, so it lay on the floor. And I re reached over to report flack out my window and reached over on the floor to pick up my switch. When I looked, came back up, my window was gone. <laughs> and there was flack light smoking on the floor. So I, I was really lucky. I, you know, I didn't have it bad. This is what I would like to impress on anyone that's you or anyone else that sees this. I did very little compared to so many others. I, I, honestly, I did. It, it was just, you think about the Japanese battalion that went through Italy. They were heroes. They, they had it tough. Um, well, I do want to talk about what you did, though, in the sense of just your missions. You, you know, yes. what, what does it feel like when the... Germans are shooting at you, and, and I mean, <laughs> what are they shooting at you, too? What type of well, you had, 88s? Uh, or what they oh, no, you had uh, three different size, uh, 75s, uh, 90s, and what, 105s. And uh, we dispensed chaff, you know, what chaff is. It, it's supposed to divert their radar. Well, we shovel that stuff. <laughs> but uh, we were shot at every mission. Now some didn't hit us. Some missions they put quite a few holes in our plane. But one thing I'd like to say that other than being shot at, I saw three mid-air collisions. We had P-38s were a short range uh, fighter and they picked us up coming back from missions or going on short missions. And I saw two of those collide and no pilots got out. And I saw two B-24s collide on the right just before we hit the coast of Yugoslavia. One plane turned up about 10 feet of wing and got back to the base. The other one hit the uh, rudder assemblies and it went out of control. Had one young man, I, one person got out, gunner probably, and his chute opened and the plane B-24 going down in kind of a flat spin caught his chute and went down. It's the only body they recovered. Then I saw two more B-24s go together uh, on a raid to Germany. Uh, one kept going and the other, they bailed out. I guess the plane went down. I didn't get, we flew and passed. But there was more to it than just being shot at, you know. The, uh, after our plane went down and the pilot and two gunners were killed, our navigator had been promoted to lead navigator, the squadron lead navigator, and it only left six of us. We weren't a complete crew, so we filled in. And our co-pilot checked out his first pilot, and he was a heck of a fine man. 
So we wanted to fly with him when we could, the ones that were remaining. I went up one night to check the board and we to fly the next morning with a different pilot. So we went and asked them to change us, to put us with our, co -pilot, with our pilot, and they did. And that plane flew on our left wing and went down the next day. Yeah. What yeah. were your thoughts about the Germans back then and Hitler and everything that Hitler well, was doing? Well, I mean, you know, at 18, 19 years old, I don't know that anybody really thinks about things like that. Uh, you, you just kind of did what you were what you thought you were supposed to do. We, uh, my engineer was a fine little man, he was from Chicago, he was Italian. Spoke perfect English and perfect Italian. His mom and dad had both come from Italy. And they spoke, still spoke Italian at home. So Tony and I ran together quite a bit, drank together and fought a little bit with others. And, uh, We'd walk down the town of Lecce in Italy, and if we walked up behind people and they were talking about us, they got the snot beat out of them. <laughs> well, that, that's, that, now that's truth. It, uh, he, he understood every word that was said, and in fact, they thought he was from Italy, but uh, we had a few little fights over there with the Italian people, simply because they did resent us being there. Uh, did I tell you? We went to Gioia del Colle, Italy, when we first went over, took a plane in there. That was a replacement depot for crews and planes. Then they sent us down to Lecce, Italy, to 98th Bomb Group. And uh, the day we got in, that night was the invasion of southern France. They had uh, been practicing. They had never flown a night mission. They had been practicing to fly one. That night, Three planes blew up on the end of the runway, and one blew up over the airfield. The three that blew up on the end of the runway had, uh, yeah, hand grenades attached to the nose wheel. When the nose wheel came up, it pulled the pin and blew the plane up. The one on, overhead still had the landing gear down. They were coming back in. One engine had gone out and they were coming back in to land. They told them they couldn't come back in because of the blow up on the end of the runway. Pulled up his landing gear and blew up over the, run, over the field. 39 killed that night. So you, you were introduced in a hurry. Uh, as I said, you know about the other planes, mid-air collisions. There's more to it than just being shot at. The, a lot of those people gave their lives and I was in radio school with a fellow that was 28 years old. I was 18. I thought I knew everything. You know, 18 years old, you know everything. You, you, at least I thought I did. And I was kind of a wiseacre. That wasn't what he said, but, that's, <laughs> but uh, he, he was from Beaumont, Texas. And he called me over to the side one day. He had gone through radio school with me. Then we were together two or three places and, and went to Tonopah, Nevada for crew training together. And he was a radio operator on one plane and I was with another crew. And I saw his plane go down and crash and burn. That was my introduction right there to the danger. Not, not like I say, not just about being shot at, but just flying. Uh, Fernie L. Davis was his name, 28 years old, and uh, he talked to me. I mean, didn't really put me down, just kind of talked to me, and I think it really helped me, helped my attitude a lot. I learned not to be a big mouth. I, talked, I still talk a lot, but, but he, uh, I saw his plane go down and burn, and I didn't know who was on it at the time, but I found out later that he was. So I lost a lot of good friends other than from being shot at or, or, or the Germans doing their job. I, I, if this is shown to anyone, I want them to know that I did very little. You know, it was a big war. There were, what's, we had millions in the war. And those poor ground troops like Battle of the Bulge and then the Pacific Islands, uh, D-Day, my engineer's brother was killed at V-Day. The little Italian I was telling you about, his brother was killed at D-Day. Those people contributed more 
they're your real, real heroes. Of the, I don't care what anyone else says. That's, that's my attitude and I'll stick with it. <laughs> I was very fortunate to go through without, I hurt my ankle when I bailed out, but uh, I bailed out coming down in northern Italy in the mountains. I came down in an olive orchard, November. 12th, Thursday the 12th of November, and I thought everything happened on Friday the 13th, but, it did. but the trees were like this, uh, and there was a huge boulder, probably four feet high in the front and eight in the back, and maybe 10 feet across. And that's what I came down on, and it knocked me out, sprained my ankle. When I came to, the two little Italian, short Italian men were carrying me with one arm around their shoulder, each shoulder. and. I, I remember trying to get my head up, and finally did. They stopped, and I couldn't stand up because my and their sister. They, it was a farm. She brought me an egg, punched a hole in it, wanted me to suck that egg. I couldn't do that, so she went back and got me a milk, about four ounces of milk, goat milk. It's the only fresh milk I had while I was in Italy, but it was good. But they were very nice to me. Then the priest came in a little Volk, uh, Fiat. You know, it seemed to be about that long. <laughs> Have you ever seen one of the older Fiats prior to World War II? They were probably about eight feet long, you know, and not a real small car. But they were very nice to me. Uh, let, me let me ask you some more questions okay. about combat in World War II. And, I mean, how do you get through the harder times? I mean, you had, you had some hard times. Is it your training? Yeah. Do you have your faith in God? Are you praying? I mean, how, how do you, and then how do you, how do you I think, uh, process... Uh, a day at the end of the day, especially when you lose your friends. I mean, it, uh, you accept it. If you let it get to you, now when we came down, our plane went down, the upper turret gunner lost it. He could, he could no longer fly. He, he flew one mission after that and just drove us crazy. So they took him off flying status. But you can't, you have to accept it I don't know if you would say it was part of war or you just accept it, whatever, how you, but you accept it. Like the night, the first night in the outfit, 39 people died. You know it's possible. You know it's possible at any time, but whether it happens to you or not, you don't put that together, really. You don't even think about it. You, you do your job, and that's it. And uh, I don't think any of it, I remember a hell of a lot of it. And I don't like to, because sometimes I dream about it. And I think about it a lot. But I, I don't know whether it's mind control, whether you can control your mind that much, or whether you blank it out or what. You don't really feel it as a personal thing. If, if it happens, it happens, and that's about it. I don't, that's about the only way I could put it, because seeing people die friends, people you knew, uh, most of them young men, young, probably less than 30 years old. You just accept it. I, if you th let it, if you think about it and it let it bother you personally, you can't make it. So you just, I don't know how, you, how I can explain it, but you accept it as part of what you're doing. And that's about all I can say about that. It, you never forget. You never forget very much of it at all. It's always there. You can go back and remember things that day by day things even that didn't have anything to do with flying missions, uh, standing guard. You know, you have. I tell you about people, real weird people. We had one gunner that came over from England. They shipped us a bunch of gunners in from England. And uh, one was a pretty nice kid, we thought. But they, when you, you had an escape, escape packet that they gave you for every mission, then you had to turn it back in. It had $40 in American money in it, which was, would go a long way over there then during the war. 
and had four maps, four silk maps of the countryside, countries around. I, I couldn't read one any of them. make it, if I'd gone down, they would just have captured me, I'm sure, because I, I, didn't, I didn't have that much experience on reading maps or anything. But uh, they found that someone had been taking those escape packets and taking their $40 out and gluing them back together. And they caught him one day, came in, and the packet, when he turned it in, it had fresh glue on it, and he had just thrown a glue, glue bottle in the trash. He got six months in the DD, and I escorted him to the prison. We got within about 100 yards of the prison, the lights came on, and there they were with rifles on us, guns on us, and I had a submachine gun in the boot. And we gave them the paperwork, and they wouldn't let us come any closer. That was it. And they took him. Now I went back, took another prisoner back up there later, in the daytime, and they escorted us around and let us watch the. They marched those prisoners eight hours a day, with a rifle on their shoulder, eight hours a day. Uh, but how can you do your friends like he did? You know, if you'd use one of those that he had taken the money out of on, if you'd had to bail out and had one of those that he had taken the money out of, you, you wouldn't have gotten very far. Sure. The, uh, the Yugoslavians were very good to our crews when they bailed out over there. They tried to take care of We had one crew go down and I met one of the men later, he was in the hospital down in Florida. He had broken both legs and he bailed out and the Yugoslavians had taken the other crew members and taken them in and spread them out with families until they could work them back to the Americans. But he was so bad that they had to turn him over to the Germans for medical attention. And uh, at the end of the war, then they flew him back and he was down in, my, in Florida in a hospital. And I got, went down to see him. It's, you, you develop close friendships but even though you know them, you're with them every day, you might go eat with them, you go into town with them, you, you still can't let it get to you. You, you just can't do it. I, I, and I don't know how to say it or explain why, how you block it out. It, it, so after the war, you, you forgot about it for many years? or you? No, you, you, don't, you never forget it. Yeah. You, you, and you don't talk too much about it because you're not with those same people. You're not with the same age group or related groups where they've done the war with you or similar things. Uh, not many of them re-enlisted. Not too many of the old ones re-enlisted I did. And uh, after thir I stayed out 13 months. And one of those real good friends talked me into re-enlisting. I could kill him. <laughs> he was from my hometown. We were both from a small town in Texas. And he had been assigned to recruiting. Knew me personally, so, oh yeah, come on, we'll give you this and this and this. And they did and sent me to Japan. <laughs> what was your rank at this time? Tech sergeant. Okay. It was kind of a, in the Army, if you held a position, you held that rating, whatever it was. If, if you're a cook, they were assigned certain ratings, that's the rating you held. If you were a supply in the Army, and it called for a certain rating, that's what you held. Now you might, if you left it and went down, you might not hold that rating. If you went above it, you got the rating above it. But uh, uh, engine, the gu other gunners on the plane, the other four gunners were staff sergeants, and the engineer and I were tech sergeants. We really, uh, this was with every crew. That uh, didn't depend on individual capabilities necessarily, <laughs> just, that was the position, you filled it, you had the rating, and that was it. Uh, I enjoyed Italy. I met a lot of nice people over there. Uh, like I say, there were some that definitely resented us being there. The Italians didn't have anything. I mean, they basically they had nothing. There were some that did, but most of them were very poor. Uh, we'd go through the mess hall, you ate out of your mess kit, your, you know what the mess kits were, sure. and canteen and knife, fork, and spoon. Well, they'd wait outside the mess hall, 
And if you had anything in your mess kit left, they wanted it, if it was edible. Then they washed your mess kit in the three uh, cans. And I got to know one of the younger men. He had two kids at home. So I would manage to load up a little extra and take it out to him when, when, when I went out and he always washed my mess kit, but he could get some food. You know. uh, sometimes they had the large baked potatoes, so when I'd get, a, you know, they were huge baked potatoes, and that would feed at least one or two of his family. What were your thoughts about Hitler and what he was trying to do in the war? And we and didn't even, even you know, we I mean, didn't even consider Hitler. I don't I don't know of anyone that we considered the Germans at all. It was just a job, more or less, and that's what you did. What are your targets? Oh God, I went to went like I say, I went to Munich three times. I went to a target in Poland one time. Went to factories, Buc marshalling troops, yards, uh, marshalling yards, uh, factories, uh, and um, how about? Ground trips, convoys, yeah. or those are the... Spiders? Yeah, we went to... The Germans were being driven out of uh, Yugoslavia and Greece, and they were encamped on the airport at Athens. Thousands of them. And we went over with cluster bombs and wiped out thousands of them. That's, this was very personal. I remember that one distinctly because you knew that they were there. There was no way they could avoid it. And the cluster bombs, you have a cluster, probably nine in a cluster and 18 to go, and what, maybe 10 of those bombs. And when they dropped, they expanded, they broke loose, and the individual bomblets fell. And they were anti-personnel. And they, you know, we, we must have killed thousands of them on the airport that day. Yeah, you remember things like that. But it still wasn't a personal, you know, hating Hitler or hating the Germans. It was just kind of a job to do. Uh, well, you, when you're in combat, whether you're on the ground or in the air or on the sea, I mean, as a young man, is there an invincibility about what you no, do? No, not necessarily. I don't believe so. In my case, I know it wasn't. Uh, I was well aware of <laughs> what could happen because I saw it happen so often. Uh, but you... It isn't a personal affair. It's a job. It's something that you're contributing. This is something I'm, and I still do. Not at, not at my age now, but after I retired, I contributed. Still try to contribute in some way. I was scoutmaster twice. I've been uh, county council. I've been a justice of peace. But you owe, and I don't think there's a lot of people in the U.S. that realize this. You owe. Even you, you owe to, the, to your country. You owe something. And I don't think you ever really feel that you've done enough. If you feel it at all, you, you never feel that you've done enough. Uh, I still make some telephone calls about certain things, especially the water situation here in Clark County. Uh, doesn't do much good, but at least you try. And I, I think that everyone, I don't care who he is or she, you owe something. You, you need to contribute something. You're taking all the time. So you need, and I think that during the war, that's about the way we felt. We're, we're doing our part. It may not be a huge thing at all, our little bit, but it's our part, and, and we did it. Uh, well, do, you, do, you, do you think our country is forgetting about what happened in World War II? Yes. And not just World War II, Vietnam, the Korean War. I had a friend in Indiana. After I retired, I went to Indiana and worked for the Navy. He was a Korean War veteran. He didn't retire. He was it, he was up at, at the Chosan Reservoir, and it got cool up there. And there were four of them in a foxhole one night. And uh, the two would sleep, and two would stay awake. Well, when they relieved he and his friend relieved two of them. They went to sleep. Then his friend went to sleep. The next morning, all three of them are frozen. To... Now he was. It bothered him. It really did. But uh, I don't know why. You know, you you can't. I don't care what they do for them. You can't make it right. I mean, with within him, within that person. 
Well, that's interesting you mentioned The Chosen because I, I'm, for, I'm finishing my first documentary on Korea and the focus obviously is The Chosen Reservoir. And what you said was exactly true. I mean, I, um, I've heard some gruesome stories about the cold, 30 degrees below zero. Snow. Oh, yes, that's what it was. Can you believe that? Yes. And, and uh, you had to constantly be aware that the Chinese were massing to... Oh, yeah. I just had a... In the past three months, I've had three good friends die. Uh, one was a year younger than me, but he went to the Navy when he was 17. So we had about the same... Yeah. time frame on uh, military experience. And the other two went in during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. Now the one that I just heard of lately was up in Tacoma, Washington. He was a black master sergeant. When I lived up there we used to go fishing and crabbing together and he was a three tours in Vietnam. Yeah. Three tours. Wow. Now there's a hero. Yeah. Three tours in Vietnam. Here's my first film on Vietnam. I just finished. Oh you did? <laughs> Powerful. I wish. Uh, I'm going to do another one. Yeah, uh, but I just found out I that you know I, that bothers me uh, losing people like that, uh, and they were all three younger than me. That's why am I here and why are they gone? That's you know, you think about it. Uh, well, again, a question that I've asked and you've already answered it, but you know why? Why do you think you survived and a lot of guys didn't? That one's easy to answer. It wasn't my time. The time I reached over to pick up the mic and had my window blown out, that wasn't my time. I've been in accidents, it wasn't my time. When we bailed out, I got out. Some three didn't. It wasn't my time. It, you're not going to let your time, so you better use your time wisely. If you, you know, that's why I say we owe. Uh, Are you a religious man, a praying man? Uh, I, yes. How about uh, back during the war, did you find yourself? Not, not to that extent, no. Uh, yes, I am a born-again Christian. And I definitely believe you will not go. This is preordained. <laughs> this is what it is. This, yeah, your, your time is set, and you don't name it. I, I don't name my time. Uh, I'll go when, when I'm called, and that's it. Now, there were a lot that were very religious and some not religious at all. Uh, but they all, they all did their bit, their, their, their thing, what they were called on to do. It was uh, tough on a lot of people. It was tough on families back here. Uh, you can't say how much they contributed, you know, that they knew their husbands or sons, fathers were over there being shot at, killed, and yet they sacrificed here at home too. Not as much as your active personnel overseas in the war, but they did sacrifice. But baseball players are not heroes. There's not a soul in Hollywood that's a hero. Most of them are buried overseas. Yeah. Have you ever been over to France and Luxembourg? And Three times. You can go to the cemetery in Luxembourg? No, uh, the Colville Cemetery, American Cemetery, Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach, yeah. Okay, if you, yeah. if you get back over and you're going to Italy, go to the American Cemetery there. That's where our crew, three, three crew members are buried. Tell me about your experience going there and what you felt when you went to that cemetery. The Luxembourg. Now this, that's moving also. And you remember in Flanders Field, I took my scout troop over there. They were really impressed. They really were. It, uh, it'll, that would stay with them. Yeah, the rest of their lives, thousands and thousands of crosses. Thousands. Not, not a small cemetery, it's huge. And, and uh, they had the ceremonies, and my scouts were really impressed. But you think that all of those that went over, there's an awful lot of them that didn't come back. And uh, that's why people like me should be grateful. You did what you thought you were supposed to do. You did what you were called on, but you came back. Be grateful you came back. If you go over... I, I can give you the name of our three that are buried there. If you go to Italy, I'd like for you just to 
find their names. Uh, those are our heroes. Well, tell me about finding those names when you went up to them. What, what were you feeling? Uh, well, see, I went to Luxembourg. My, my crew was buried down in uh, Italy. I didn't get to the Italian cemetery. Well, where were they buried? Were you been to where they're buried? No. I went to uh, Italy twice after. Okay. Uh, well, here, let me lead into another question. Okay. As we start getting towards the end here. Um, tell me what freedom means to you, Roy. As a World War II veteran, as an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you? Uh, freedom means that this is my country and I'm part of it. Even when I passed through here the last time, I just told the attendant out there, he said something, if he said, you want to see me, come back again. I said, not for four or five years, I hope. <laughs> but this is, this is my country. Uh, freedom, I, I guess you could see it that way. Uh, but if you don't stand up for your country, good grief, you'll stand for nothing. You know, this, your own petty little ideas, you've got to submit yourself part of yourself, at least of what your country needs. I don't mind paying taxes until I have to do it but each year. <laughs> no, I, I, my wife and I pay our taxes and we get a little back every year. But again, that's part of what you owe. That is, you've got to support your country, especially our troops, um, our institutions, colleges and our police FBI, although I don't have high praise for them, but you have to support your country. Uh, so many people aren't aware of that, don't realize it or forget it, or just don't care. Uh, they, they come first. So many people put themselves above everything, everyone else, their country and everything. But you've got to support your country. This is why after I retired, I did, I've been, uh, treasurer for a county mental inst uh, institution. I've been financial secretary of a conservation club with over 2,000 members. I have organized summer, class, summer activities for a school. I have coached five, six, uh, fifth and sixth grade boys basketball, and I'm not much of a basketball player. Uh, I got good kids to teach it for me, <laughs> but you owe. You always owe. I was in the PTA for years, president two years. Mm -hmm. But these are things that come from you, you can give. Right. These are things that you can give of yourself. And eventually all this is for your country. It's Tell me about the price for freedom, the cost for freedom. Our young people don't know much about why they have what they have. They take their freedoms for granted. What would you say, Roy, to a, a young person about the price and the cost of freedom? It's going to cost you a lot more in the long run if you don't stand up for your country now. You've got to support your country and your people. You, if me comes first, me is not much. You know, the me generation, me attitude doesn't get it with me. That's, like I say, you owe, they owe. And uh, I don't think the parents are teaching their kids what has happened in the past or what could happen in the future. You've got to make the connection and bridge the gap for your kids, for all the teenagers. We have too many teachers that aren't even, they're not aware of what should be done, what can be done to contribute to your country. Volunteering here, volunteering there, helping, but keeping your country in mind first of all. You don't have to go around shouting USA number one all day long, just do your part. And each, each kid, each student, each parent, Everyone should be part of that. If me comes first, <laughs> me's not much, I'll tell you. That's, and that's honestly the way I feel about it. Well, well, you, you saw a man die, and uh, how do you communicate that to a young person as far as their freedoms today? Well, it, it, uh, it's real easy. They were doing their part for their country. They did what they did, in many cases, what was more than expected of them, but they, they contributed to their country. What you have today, you owe to those people. Uh, our, what does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? My country. If you had been 
at Nellis last Saturday on retiree day, you would know it. If you had filmed that absolute quiet in the presentation of the flag before a thousand people, you couldn't hear a sound. Not, no one made a sound. There was nothing, no movement. Men and women stood there with a hand over the heart. And this several minutes, I brought the flag in, presented the flag, and not a sound. Those people know what uh, what's, has happened in the past, and they appreciate the military, what the military has done, what it means to them and to the country. Today's military, today's military, everyone a volunteer. No draftee in the service today. The best educated military we have ever had. Today's military, the best educated and all volunteer. And I'm proud of them, very proud. And Larry, thank you for having me here. Well, this is great. Let me ask you another question. Okay. Uh, we're just about done, but what should our country remember, Roy, about World War II? Remember that these were ordinary people that went and did extraordinary jobs for their country, for their families back here, for the country as a whole. But these were just so many of them, back then there was a lot, so many farms, small farms, so many of them were just farm boys, some no education, very little education, but they went and did their part. Now when I was going through basic training, and this is fact, we had people that could not read and write. They had a school to teach people to read and write. But they were patriots. I knew a 40-year-old man as a volunteer. He couldn't read or write. But they let him volunteer and kept him as a, uh, in the squadron as kind of a barracks orderly and do, do work around the squadron and he went to school. To learn, to learn it and read and write. These were patriots too. But back then, so many people were fresh off the farm. Basically uneducated as far as worldly affairs, even state affairs. Some had never been out of the county where they were raised. But they believed in the USA. They proved it and a lot of them were still over there. Never come back. If you go and make a film about the cemeteries over there, and you get to Luxembourg, Belgium, recite that poem, In Flanders Field, the poppies grow. Familiar with that very much, so. And show it to high schools. Uh, if I could, that's what I would do. Go to every foreign cemetery, every American cemetery in a foreign country. Film it bring back some of the names, and show it in schools. Well, you know, I do go into schools and talk to kids. Oh, you do? I, that's part of why I'm producing this, is to go into schools oh. and educate our younger generation. I travel with an 84-year-old World War II veteran. Oh, you do? And we go and make presentations, and they talk to him. In fact, CBS did a national news story on my project Memorial Day. And in that story, which is on my website, um, it shows us going and talking to kids and the emotion and the history of what we're doing. So this is a this is a very educational project. Good. Yeah. I, they're the ones now. They're my, my time really has passed. You're right in the middle of yours. How old are you, Larry? I just turned fifty. So you've got several more years of production within you, <laughs> yeah. But this has to be passed down to those following you, to the next generation, the next, and on further on down. And I think the schools are the way to do it. Uh, it's too late for the parents. Uh, let me, let me, we can talk uh, just a bit more, but let me finish the interview. At the end of my interview, I asked the veterans to give me a salute into the camera from where you're seated. When I tell you, can you do that? Yes. Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> This is one of the best parts of the documentary, so. Well, I want to thank you for allowing me to uh, express myself. You bet. Well, when you called, I knew I needed to talk to you. So it's, uh, I had a lot of calls. 
lot of calls. Did you? Well, well that's good. You, so well, there's let me ask you that. Why, why, you, why did you want to talk to me today? What prompted you to read the story and talk to me? Hoping that this would be seen by the very ones at the school age, the ones that are following, the generations following. They need to see this and know this and know how we feel about it. And I think most of the veterans, especially World War II veterans, feel as I do about it, that you owe. This is part of what you can do for your country. And uh, I, I think that uh, if they understand this, then the, they will do their part. It may not be in the military, but in some way they'll help their country. Sure. And I think that's worthwhile. They're, like I say, I was a scoutmaster a couple of times over Germany and here in the States, and uh, that was contributing, I think. Go ahead and give me, a, look into the camera and give me a salute. Go ahead. Right on. Okay. I thank you.